Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, the captain, and somebody that is with me never. From Generation Why Is Nick Drinking a Michelob Ultra at Crime Con, here's Justin. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. I'm happy to be seen myself, my friend. On today's show, I'll be drinking Guinness, or what I like to call the adult protein shake. It's my go-to beer. When I used to drink beer, I was a Newcastle man. There you go. So Newcastle was always the in-between between a, a dark beer like Guinness, but it was always a bit, you know, nice brown ale. And if you're wondering, where is the colonel? Well, my friends, he's tied up in the basement. Along with Aaron from Generation Y, we decided to do a little bit of a wife swap, if you know what I mean. Don't worry, we won't hurt him. So let's gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer, and let's talk some true crime. Sunday, July 31st, 1966, 6.45 p.m. I don't understand what it is that compels me to type this letter. Perhaps it is to leave some vague reason for the actions I have recently performed. I don't really understand myself these days. I am supposed to be an average, reasonable, and intelligent young man. However, lately... I can't recall when it started. I have been a victim of many unusual and irrational thoughts. These thoughts constantly recur, and it requires a tremendous mental effort to concentrate on useful and progressive tasks. In March, when my parents made a physical break, I noticed a great deal of stress. I consulted a Dr. Cockrum at the University Health Center and asked him to recommend someone that I could consult with about some psychiatric disorders I felt I had. I talked with the doctor once for about two hours and tried to convey to him my fears that I felt come overwhelmingly violent impulses. After one season, I never saw the doctor again. And since then, I've been fighting my mental turmoil alone and seemingly to no avail. After my death, I wish that an autopsy would be performed on me to see if there's any visible physical disorder. I've had some tremendous headaches in the past and have consumed two large bottles of Excedrin in the past three months. It was after much thought that I decided to kill my wife, Kathy, tonight after I pick her up from work at the telephone company. I love her dearly. She has been as fine as a wife to me as any man could ever hope to have. I cannot rationally pinpoint any specific reason for doing this. I don't know whether it is selfishness or if I don't want her to have to face the embarrassment my actions would surely cause her. At this time though, the prominent reason in my mind is that I truly do not consider this world worth living in and am prepared to die. I do not want to leave her to suffer alone in it. I intend to kill her as painlessly as possible. Similar reasons provoked me to take my mother's life also. I don't think the poor woman has ever enjoyed life as she is entitled to. She was a simple young woman who married a very possessive and dominating man all of my life as a boy until I ran away from home to join the Marine Corps. The rest of the letter is handwritten and illegible. How you doing tonight, Captain? I'm doing great. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks for asking. No problem. Tonight's case is something that I've been a little obsessed with for a while. Sadly, it's because of the rise of mass shootings here in America. Right. And I realize that this isn't the 
original mass shooting that America ever saw, but I think it could be one of the most popular ones or well-known ones. Mm -hmm. Do you think? Yeah, definitely. So this is the case of Charles Whitman and the University of Texas Tower shooting, or Texas Tower Sniper is what he was known as. And on July 31st, 1966, Charles Whitman sits down to write the letter that you just heard. He's not understanding these, I guess, uh, impulses he's having. He's struggling with, I guess, homicidal tendencies and this fantasy of going up on this tower and gunning people down. Yeah, he definitely has some anger management problems. Just a few. And uh, he decides that he's going to start with his own mother. His mother had recently moved to his his part of town, and he went over to her house and went inside and bludgeoned her and then ended up stabbing her to death. Yeah, what's interesting is after he beat her to death, he actually took her body and placed it back into her bed to make it look like she was sleeping. Yeah, he put a sheet over her, and then he wrote, do not disturb on a note, put it on the front door, like you do at a hotel, I guess. <laughs> uh, but this is her home. I'm just thinking about this, and I'm thinking, I've never seen anyone put a do not disturb sign on a door to a home. And I'm kind of freaked out that he thought that this would deter people uh, so now if I ever see somebody with a do not disturb sign on their door, I'm definitely calling in a, a welfare check on them. But yeah, yeah, just instantly call 911. Yeah. <laughs> His wife is at work. She's working a six to 10 shift and he goes and gets her and takes her home. He had planned to murder his wife in a way where she wouldn't suffer. At least that's what he thought in his head. So you would think, pull out a gun, shoot her. But instead, he will end up stabbing her to death, which to me is totally not a quick way to die. It's a brutal way to die, and it's a horrible way to die, right? According to him, happily married, but he doesn't want his next actions to fall back on his wife or his mother and We'll go into more of that later, but yeah, because when he returns to his typewriter to continue this note, he claims that he killed his mom and his uh, wife just to spare them yeah. from what was going to take place. Now, what I wonder is he obviously wasn't trying to spare their life, but he was maybe trying to, to uh, spare their I, what I guess embarrassment or the fact that these individuals would be connected to him after he did this tower shooting. Yeah, I mean, I know with his mother, he felt that she didn't have the best life, so it was almost a mercy killing. But his wife, she had a, she was married to him. They were happily married. He's self medicating at this point, and he's taking methamphetamine. Yeah, might not be thinking too straight. So, uh, I, you know, I can analyze what he was thinking, but why he chose the way he would do this is a whole other uh, question. Yeah. So after he's murdered his wife, he starts collecting things and he goes and writes some bad checks and buys some weapons. He already owns a bunch of weapons, but he's going to purchase more. And he has a footlocker. He was ex-military, so that's what they're used to carrying a lot of their stuff around is a footlocker. And he gets rope. He gets food. He gets water. Yeah, they, they claim that he had enough supplies for two weeks and then 700 rounds of ammo. And again, I think anyone that's paid attention lately... You know that a, a mass shooting's not going to last very long. This guy was planning for the long haul. He figured he would be doing this for a while. That's kind of creepy, right? Yeah, well, you'd think if you continue shooting from a tower and for two weeks that if they don't 
come and get you and kill you that at some point people are just not going to go around that tower. Yeah. <laughs> You'd think. This is the arsenal that we know that he had. He had a Luger 9 millimeter pistol. He had a Smith & Wesson 357 Magnum uh, revolver. He had mm. a, uh, an M1 carbine rifle. A Remington Model 141, it's a 35 caliber uh, rifle. A Remington 700 six millimeter rifle. Sears Model 60 semi-automatic shotgun. It's 12 gauge. Just a lot of guns. And then he had a uh, a 25 caliber pistol as a, I guess, his final backup. This guy believed he had like 10 hands. Yeah. So he's got all of this and he packs it all up in his footlocker and decides I'm going to go down to this tower and set up all my weapons and start gunning people down. But he has to get there first. And it's not the, it's not like you can just show up with all this and walk up there and no one's going to notice. So he's got to obfuscate a little bit and he's got to use some social engineering to get in. So he uh, arrives at the parking lot. He says he's like a research student or something to that effect, right? Yeah, it's weird because I actually saw a documentary where they talk about him wearing like repairman, like a repairman outfit. Like a janitor, yeah. But, yeah, but then for some reason when he gets there, he's like, this might not work. So he tells the guy at the parking lot, I'm, I'm a researcher. So he's allowed to park in the parking lot. He gets a dolly, and he puts everything in his, you know, footlocker, and he covers it up, and he puts it on the dolly, and he wanders right into the building, he jumps on the elevator, and goes up to the top floor, because he's trying to make it to the rooftop. Different reports will say 27th or 28th floor, but regardless, he has to carry all this upstairs once he gets there, but he, he comes across uh, Edna, who is like the receptionist and initially he he tells her i'm here to repair something and she doesn't really buy his story uh, and she says she needs to call someone to verify and when she turns her head to call he actually beats her and drags her bloodied body like behind a couch and hides her there he doesn't kill her or he doesn't shoot her right away. He's actually beaten her first. And then he's going to the stairwell because you have to go up these, this flight to get up to the rooftop. And it's like three, I think three or four flights of stairs that he has to drag this, you know, dolly with all his crap on. And when he's going back, a family shows up that's wanting to go up on the rooftop also and do the, uh, the tour so now he's stuck in this situation where he's just beat this poor old lady and then there's this family there and that's when he starts shooting and he opens fire on the on the family first yeah he ends up killing two of the family members not really for sure how many he wounded but i know that he killed two the first guy is i hope i'm saying this what right but it's uh mike gabar that's He's actually a cadet for the Air Force. And so he starts shooting and he wounds multiple family members and kills two of them instantly. Once he figures they've retreated or they're no longer in, in his line of sight, he actually goes back over to Edna and shoots her and finishes her off. And then he ascends these stairwells. And uh, it's said that because he had this heavy dolly with all the stuff on it, every single step made a huge bang sound and people heard it in the building and didn't quite know what it was, but it was him dragging this dolly up this flight of stairs. Have you seen footage of like what his viewpoint would be looking down off the top? Yeah. Yeah. He had, yeah. Cause it's, it's, it's high enough to give me the, heebie-jeebies as far as like because i'm afraid of heights yeah. so when they start showing like what he would be seeing when he looked down on people it's a lot higher up than you would think and sadly it gave him a really good field of vision 
and kill zones yeah. to, you know, go on this, you know, uh, rampage here. Well, right. And let's, let, but let's stay on that point for a second. Cause yes, good vantage point, but you have to be a pretty good shot. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. And, uh, he was ex military. He was in the Marines. He got uh, yeah. an expert badge, uh, which is not the highest badge you can get, but the second highest. Right. So he's pretty good. Shooter. Yeah. And he, you know, the Marines, they have a pretty good, their test, especially back then, I'm sure was pretty hard to pass. Uh, when I was in the right. army, I actually hit 40 out of 40, but I don't think I had to shoot at as many targets as the Marines back in 1943 did. <laughs> Once he's up on the tower, he distributes his guns on all four sides. And it's like a, an observation deck, but there's a square in the middle and then there's the perimeter. So you can only walk around on the perimeter of this. And there's little gaps and holes in the, the concrete rails. So he's shoving the barrels of these weapons through and making sure that no matter what side he's on, there's always a weapon there. And then he's got his, uh, his rifle in his hand. That's going to be his primary weapon. That the, the, basically the way to think of this is think of Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks and sleepless in Seattle and think about the last scene. That's kind of how the tower is set yeah. up. And another <laughs> thing this allows him to do is you know you have a shotgun and you're this high up shotguns not going to kill somebody possibly at that range or it's going to be really hard to hit someone with a shotgun rifles they got they have the range or even as pistols but mm -hmm. it, one of the shotguns is just laying there sticking out as he walks past it he'll just pull the trigger and it goes off and then he's around the corner shooting at somebody else. So it gives the illusion that there are multiple people up on this observation deck firing. What's also interesting about the position he's in is I believe that these walls are concrete and they're over 30 centimeters thick. Mm -hmm. So basically he has the ability to shoot. And the only thing that that law enforcement could shoot back at would be like the top of his head. Yeah. So even if they shot the wall that he was right behind, it was not going to penetrate through the wall. No. And when he starts firing, uh, the few police officers that are around that, you know, they were issued revolvers and shotguns at the time, and, you know, 38 caliber pistol. It's, I mean, the bullets going to make it up there, but then once it hits that, that, cement block that you know concrete wall it's it's not doing anything and they have a tiny right. target to to pinpoint and it's just not going to work out for them at all because they're outgunned and they he has the higher ground so they can't they can't do anything mm -hmm. one of his first victims that he shoots when he gets on this tower is a pregnant woman well, and this shows you how big of a piece of shit this Charles guy is because he, he, it, he, it's not like he shoots her in the head or the arm or the chest or anything. He goes right down and shoots her in her pregnant yeah. belly. And it's, it's almost, I mean, no, I won't even say it's almost. It is his intent to shoot her in the belly because he's a good shot. He'll make some other shots up here that are, far further distance through tiny holes so he knows where he's shooting her yeah and of course people are running out to save her and her boyfriend and they are now targets and this is what snipers do that first shot isn't always the shot to kill somebody sometimes that first shot is to wound somebody and then all your buddies come out to save you. And that gives the sniper more targets to pick off. Yeah. So it's a disabling shot. Well, and he, and the, I believe he picked a pregnant woman because more people are likely to run to the aid of her exactly. than, than anybody else. He 
goes on and shoots multiple people and there's like three friends that are from like the peace corps that are just going out for lunch he mm-hmm. guns them down it it's just people random people throughout their day and i think it's i don't know what 20 minutes into the shooting that now everyone down below understands what's happening and are starting to are starting to take cover <laughs> starting to to duck out and hide well and that's what's strange is uh you know if you've been ever if you've ever been outside playing at night and you hear possibly a gunfire or maybe a firework or mm-hmm. something sometimes it's hard to figure out where it's coming from yeah. so it sounds crazy but it's like you said it takes people over 20 minutes to kind of figure out one that there's somebody shooting from the tower and because there's so many people that are going out in open areas looking around trying to figure out where this fire is coming from yeah. there's a uh, a journalist named Richard Hill who hears that somebody's been shot at the tower so he grabs his pen and paper and drives on down because he doesn't understand that there's a sniper and so he gets there he jumps out of his car and he sees a bunch of students like huddled underneath like an awning or something right. and they're telling him you know like take cover and they're like you better not walk out there and they're actually laughing when they say it they're saying man you better take cover you better get out of here and richard doesn't it doesn't click you know it's it, he doesn't take them seriously because he's not understanding the situation and i hate to say it but i'm kind of like these kids i might laugh at the wrong time at when something's just so atrocious or just ridiculous like what we're now mm-hmm. huddled underneath this awning uh so well it's just a nervous yeah. laughter richard is walking and he's being shot at now uh, <laughs> because he didn't quite get it he was actually just going to report about probably edna mm-hmm. yeah and didn't know um and there's if you ever find yourself in a situation like this, there's line of sight. And if they can see, if you can see them, then they can see you. And then there's cover and concealment. Concealment just means you're behind, I don't know, a car or an awning. So the person can't see, can't see you. But cover right. is you're actually behind a wall or behind a, an embankment that gives you protection so a lot of these people are just concealing themselves behind just chairs and whatnot and if charles sees them behind something and sees them moving he can still fire upon them and that bullet's going to go right through whatever they're hiding behind and hit them All right, we're back. Cheers, mates. Well, do you know if they knew how many shooters there were in the tower? No, they didn't know until the final moments. And they assumed, yeah, they definitely assumed there was more than one. There was more than one because of the amount of fire coming from the tower, the amount of gunshots coming, because like I said, he would just pull the trigger, you know, on a 12 gauge shotgun on one side and then run over the other side and take take a pop shot at somebody how you watch the youtube clip of the yeah yes yeah, it's, it's like weird because at first it seems like a movie i mean like this clock tower it kind of has that hint of um back to the future yeah the, cl- the clock tower and and so when you see it in black and white and all you see is the gun smoke coming and it's so unclear who's shooting or if there is a shooter Almost looks like it's coming out of nowhere. Yeah. And when you hear multiple shots fired in quick succession, you you don't assume that's one person. 
And then when you have the police officers returning fire, you can't really make out how many people are shooting, how many perpetrators there are. It's just madness. Uh, He ends up hitting an electrician named Roy Dell Schmidt from 500 yards away. So that's five football fields. This guy had been hiding behind his car for over 30 minutes since the, since the shooting started. And he thought, it's safe. I'll stand up. Now, was there anybody as the shooting um, was taking place that ever said this possibly could be Charles Whitman? No. they. they I, at, from my knowledge, uh, they were just responding to the incident. And they had no idea that his wife and mother were... At their homes. Well, because he because he put a do not disturb yeah. sign on the mother's door, so nobody disturbed yeah. it. <laughs> there it is. That's why his note worked. Uh, he shot another. He what? shot another man that was behind a, uh, I guess like a construction barricade or a spindle, and there was just like a small, like six inch gap between the wood, and he was able to hit this man. Shit, that's that's a good. Yeah, shot. it's it's just brutality and he's very efficient at it so the shooting lasts about 96 minutes yeah from start so like r- roughly like the the length of a judd apatow film you like my awful yes. references <laughs> i said sleepless in seattle uh back to the future and now judd apatow. i'm like sleepless in fucking seattle <laughs> we have a shooter or multiple shooters the law enforcement doesn't know, but at some point, when you have thirty over thirty centimeters of concrete basically blocking the psychopath, you have to enter the tower. Now you're going to get to go up in the elevator, or you can go by stairs. But at some point, you're going to have three three floors that you have to go through just by stair mm-hmm. to get to the observation deck where the the shots are being fired, but now you're going to, you're going to have to send officers in there and you don't know how many shooters there are. And the, when you get up to that observation deck, there's a lot of windows. So you're exposed to the shooter. Still, if the shooter looks inside, he can see you and there's very little uh, cover or concealment for you. When you first step out onto that observation deck. How many officers do they send up to the observation deck? Well, this one police officer named Ramiro Martinez, he was off duty that day and he heard about the shooting. So he came up and he doesn't, he, he's just showing up. Uh, and it sucks because these officers, when they're going there, they're having to walk through the dead bodies to get to the tower there's no real concealment for them. They're having to zigzag and run to the tower to get there. Well, Martinez, yeah. he's going up the elevator and he gets off and he runs into three other police officers, three other guys, uh, a guy named Alan Crum, Houston McCoy. And there's special, he's a public safety agent. And his name's Dub Cohen. Public safety agent. What? What is I, that? I'm assuming he's a uh, a security guard. Security yeah, for the guard? campus. <laughs> yeah. But can you imagine? You you have to have the biggest cojones to decide. Hey, I'm going to go up there. I have no clue how many shooters yeah. there are, but I'm going to go up there. Who's coming yeah. with? Me? And, and you got four guys. And being that this is Texas, people. You know, don't mess with Texas. They all have guns. So Cohen had actually gone home and got his rifle, brought it back, and gave it to one of the officers. I'm still waiting to read a story where the law enforcement officer had an elephant gun. <laughs> yeah. It seems like a great time for one in this scenario. Well, the, the interesting thing about this is we don't have the militarization of police until much later, yet. Here's a perfect example right. of why they might need rifles or they might need armored vehicles or stuff like that. Or pretty much a SWAT team is what I'm looking for to respond to this, not the beat cop with a pistol. We'll break down how they decide to 
enter the tower's observation deck. All three of them came out onto the observation deck, and one of them stood at the door and faced, mm-hmm. you know, whatever direction, while the other two started going around each corner looking for the shooter. So the one guy staying there, he's he's there just to see if if this shooter comes around the corner, he's there to to ambush him. So the other yeah, right. these other two guys, they're going around each corner and they have to expose themselves. They have to whip no. out their <laughs> No, 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 they have to lean over. That seems like a very weird law enforcement practice. They have to lean. We're going to be careful with your words here. They have to lean. Lean to the left. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how you said it. I didn't, you know, you can't make that I shit know. up. And they check the first corner. Coast is clear. They go to the next corner. And they they're hearing the shots and they're getting louder and louder. So they know they're, you know, they know they're getting close, but again, they think there might be two guys up here. So they're, they're kind of freaked out and they see Charles is sort of gunning somebody down. So they come up and one of them shoots him and the other one jumps down to his knees and they both fire upon him and hitting Charles and Charles had actually, sort of turned towards them at this point to engage them. Right. And, and they claim that he's, they give credit to Houston McCoy, I think for the, the kill, but like, we know the full story. I think they're, I think not only both of them should be, you know, responsible for the kill, but also the third guy that got onto the observation deck as well. But I think they credit Houston McCoy because of his name. Yeah, and if he was the first guy to shoot, whatever it is. Um, but yeah. they they want to make sure this guy's down. So they they double tap him. They go over and they give him a a fatal shot or the execution shot just to make sure. And I don't blame him one bit because this guy's been terrorizing this entire city almost for the last you know, Mm -hmm. hour and a half. And just in case he's not quite dead, they finish him off and they meet back up with, you know, their, their squad just to make sure that there's nobody else, but they're pretty sure now like, okay, we got them. And Mm -hmm. they actually are having to duck because the police down on the ground are still shooting at them. So, a few bullets actually ricochet by their heads while after. Yeah, that would be my yeah. luck. I'd go in there, I'd kill the shooter, and then I'd get yeah. shot. They have to inform people fairly quickly to cease fire <laughs> the, the shooters down. And, and sadly, as soon as they get the word out, everybody comes pouring out of the buildings. And they just knew that they'd killed this one guy up on the observation deck. They weren't too sure if there was anyone else in the tower somewhere else on another floor. Could you imagine right. hundreds of people coming out and now they're targets too. If, if this wasn't the only guy, right. But at some point you have to come out, you know, when they say the, the coast is clear at some point you have to take yeah, your chances. I just, I would just assume that there would be more, you know, with the, large amount of police presence to be like, everyone stay down. Everyone stay where you're at. Let's uh, make sure that this is all good. (laughs) Yeah. And you also wonder about if there was a second shooter and you let all these individuals out. Now you have hundreds and hundreds of people. If there was a second shooter that somehow got from the top of the tower all the way to outside again, that they could disappear. Yeah. I didn't even think of that. They could just blend right in. I mean, that's what the parkland shooter guy did. He was able to walk away and he not picked up yeah. until later. So after hearing the all clear, people are out and they uh, now have identified Charles Whitman and they're going to his home where they're going to find his dead wife. Yeah, Kathleen. Kathleen and they're going to find his murdered mother also. And that's where they're going to find his note. 
And is, is it fair to say it's a suicide I, note? Yeah, I would say it's a suicide note. Uh, or is it a homicide Well, there you note? go. You know? Uh, it's, it's almost I, both. I call American mass shooters our version of a suicide bomber, but they are able to kill a lot more people because they can shoot at them as opposed to just trying to set themselves off in the middle of a crowd. But in this note, he mentions uh, that he loved his wife. He mentions that she was a wonderful person and that he had these horrible thoughts and that he hopes that they can do an autopsy on him and look at his brain and see if there was anything that caused him to do this. And they do do that, and they end up finding a small tumor. Uh, they say it's the size of a beca- of a pecan or a pecan, depending on where you're at. <laughs> uh, it's yeah, not a tumor. Not a tumor. Uh, but it's pushing up between his thalamus, his hypothalamus. And if this is all you know about the story, well, hey, this guy was happily married. Everything was great. And then he had homicidal thoughts and he goes on right. this rampage and he has a tumor case closed, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's one of those things where it gives you an answer and then also makes you on some level feel bad for Charles Whitman. Like maybe he couldn't control himself, but I think there's evidence to point that maybe this tumor could be a percentage of the cause, but not the full yeah. cause. I always have a scale of nature versus nurture when it comes to any mass shooter, serial killer, whatever. And I always think there's a blend. I don't think it's always nurture or it's always nature. I always think it's a percentage of. Well, we've had a lot of, you know, there's a lot of people that uh, struggle and fight every day that have uh, cancerous tumors and they're not going around and shooting individuals, but the brain works in mysterious ways. So you wonder if it just grows at a certain point, if this makes people more capable of this yeah. kind of action. Uh, but I think of the DC snipers or the parkland shooter or a lot of these other people. And it's not proven that they all had tumors. Uh, a lot of them are right. either radicalized or just, did they have any idea of when this, tumor started they said it was pretty malignant and that it had there's disagreements about this tumor a lot of disagreements and some people say it's not even a tumor or they don't even believe it exists so you're right when you said it's not a tumor uh (laughs) well and maybe the reason why again why would somebody claim that there was a tumor when there wasn't well we gotta go back to the idea that Whitman was an officer, was a U.S. Marine, and that would explain away this crazy behavior, this psychotic behavior. It also ex- explain away why our uh, the Marines did nothing about it, did nothing about this person. So it gives them kind of a let them off the hook way out by saying, well, we didn't know anything about this, and Charles wasn't crazy. There was no sign of that. He had a tumor. But when we look at Charles's upbringing and his childhood, eh, there's some things in there. (laughs) And uh, his father was a domestic abuser. Well, let's start with the fact that Charles was a handsome young kid. He had like blonde hair, I think blue eyes, kind of like the all American boy. Youngest Eagle Scout in America. I think of the youngest kid to ever become a Eagle Scout at the time. Which, that's pretty cool. He is the quintessential all-American boy. Uh, I'm assuming it's because his father pushed him. He he was overbearing. <laughs> I wonder, too, is it like another excuse? Like, well, this guy was beaten by his father. Um, but back in the 50s, there was a lot more physical punishment that happened so he's beaten by his father. He hated his father. And, there's, uh, there's an incident that's talked about a lot where when he got older, a teenager, he... Uh, oh, the one where he's 19? Drunk, the story when and he comes home. And, 
and his dad uh, mm-hmm. is so upset with him that he beats him to a bloody pulp and then tries to drown him in the pool. Yeah, and well, here's the thing though: is like, I mean, he he did have a father, he had a mother, they had a pool. Things could have been worse. This is true, but he is living in a very hostile environment, and his he's watching his mother get beaten and verbally abused, emotionally abused. This is just the most right. unhealthy living situation for anyone to be in. And it's his father that is the, the evil one in this whole thing. And he hates his father with a passion. Right. He seems to be one of those fathers, too, where it's like, no matter what you do, it's not good enough. Like you, you become like the youngest Eagle Scout in American history at that point, And it's not good no. enough for your father. No, I mean, he's the youngest Eagle Scout, yet he still gets... Uh, you know, almost killed for going out and drinking. And and this is the amount of pressure that's put on Charles. So he, he joins the Marines. But even before this, there was rumors of him bullying kids. And, and basically, you know, he, he would get bullied by his father. So what did he do? He went and bullied, you know, other kids. And I think we've all seen that. I mean, I remember one time, um, in high school, there was this kid that he would fight anybody. And I thought, what what the heck's wrong with him? And then I heard that uh, every time that he got in a fight that his dad would hear about, his dad would beat him up real bad. And then you you almost wonder, why the heck is he getting in a fight then? If every time he gets in trouble for it, he gets beat up. It's almost like maybe some kind of like self-punishment. Yeah, at that point. and it's, it's a cycle of violence. Not everybody that's been abused is going to go on and abuse others, but it, it is a little bit of a stereotype. It does happen a lot. I actually wish his dad was a little bit more of a monster and would have drowned him in that pool because if they would have, then we wouldn't have the 17 innocent people dead. We wouldn't have the pregnant lady dead. We wouldn't have the 30, 31 wounded innocent people. I understand your logic, but, when he was doing this to Charles, Charles was innocent, but I get it. If, if I went back in a time machine and yeah, yeah. Which one, yeah. yeah which I, one would you pick yeah. Justin? Come on. You got to pick the dead kid in the pool. Or are you going to pick the, the 17 I, I'm, dead people? I'm going to have to swallow, swallow my pride a little bit. And, uh, one over multiple. He, uh, he joined the military and, it was during the time of, uh, wasn't it the Cuban crisis? Charles joined the Marines. They they said that he was actually really well-liked and probably had an IQ of 138, mm-hmm. which isn't bad. And then after joining the Marines, is that's when he's actually going to go uh, to Austin and start at the University yeah. of Texas. This is where he also is going to marry his wife. And then he actually goes back into the Marines during the yeah, Cuban but he, missile crisis. It's when he's meeting his wife, like his first stint with the Marines, he's exemplary. He is an awesome, clean record. He right. gets awards, all this stuff. He's in a very regi- regimented environment. And I think that's what he needed. Yeah, but see, this is when, when I wonder if the tumor mm-hmm. actually started. Or if there was maybe not even tumor as much as there possibly could be just some mental illness that started yeah. rearing its ugly head. Because like we said, he, he's in the military. Then he goes to college. He gets married. Then he goes back. And he goes from well-liked, smart, hardworking to yeah. they can't stand he's, uh He's gambling. He's drinking. He's acting as a loan shark and lending other soldiers money. And if they don't pay him or he gives them such a high interest rate that they can never pay him that he'll go and assault them. It's like, what? (laughs) And and it it gets so bad that they end up discharging him. And then that's when he goes, he decides, well, I'm going to go back to Austin and I'm going to show them. I'm going to enroll into school. Yeah. And I'm going to get my life together. But he's not. <laughs> he's what drives me nuts in a lot of these mass shootings 
is how many times there was mm-hmm. warning signs. Like there was people that came out and said that he would constantly point up to the tower and say that would be a great place to go up and yeah. shoot people and- from. Like if somebody says that, you need to tell somebody. I I just covered a similar situation on my peripheral podcast where uh, they were telling the school officials, I'm going to kill my fellow students. And uh, the school counselor said, oh, that's nice, and sent them on their way. I mean, it's pathetic. There's so many times. Look, what's the worst thing that can happen? Um, When I was in eighth grade, I heard a kid jokingly say that he was going to kill himself to another individual. The one kid was getting picked on. He kind of jokingly said to the guy, how oh, it'll be funny when I'm dead after I kill myself or something like that. And it was like, whether it's a joke or not. Yeah. I told a counselor and then they pull him down to the office. Well, guess what? He was thinking about this. He was actually thinking about killing himself at school because of bullying and all that stuff. And and that was enough to get the kid some help. And then later on, he thanks you. And in this scenario, it's like, if one of these people would have came forward and said, Charles doesn't seem like that bad of a guy, but he keeps saying these weird things about shooting people from a tower, that maybe they go get him checked out, and then they find this tumor. And if that is the cause of what happened, then maybe they get help, or they get help for a mental illness or get help for the trauma that he faced. Well, he as, saw a doctor, a uh, I think it was a psychiatrist at the university. And he told that person about his fantasy and they talked for a good two hours. And that doctor said, well, we need to talk again. And he scheduled another appointment. But of course, Charles didn't show up to the next appointment because he had other plans. Right, but that's when the doctor needs to go to law enforcement and say, we need to do something, especially, Mm -hmm. you know, an ex-Marine. And that's what makes you really wonder, was it a mental illness? Was it some trauma as as a child? Or was it this tumor? What what was the real reason for these innocent lives? Yeah, that's where I look at it, and I think you have a mix of both nature and nurture. Uh, his nurture was not good. His childhood was not good. Uh, his father was showed him that violence was the answer to everything. And the reason why his mother was living down the street and his father was on the other side of the country was because back home, mm-hmm. the neighbors were calling the cops and saying, someone's going to die if you don't get here. He's going to kill her because his father was just beating the crap out of his mother. And so she moved across country and stayed with, with Charles and his wife for a bit and then got her own place. And that's why she was there, was escaping this domestic abuse, this whole environment. But she walked into the arms of another devil to get to escape from one another one. <laughs> and like you said, you on some level you would think that Charles Whitman would want to protect his mother, especially after she gets out of this abusive situation. But again, I mean, I'm not a psychologist, so I, I don't know, but the trauma that he could have faced as a child could have been too overwhelming for possibly for him to. And, and to your question, you know, do you, choose this one child or do you choose the 17 victims i would have preferred charles just to go back and take it out on his father the person that started this whole chain of events so you change <laughs> i'm changing, changing my answer. answer that's what i would prefer you changing. just didn't give me as <laughs> if we could go back into time yes we're killing charles and charles father. could do it himself if he likes and yeah with all the guns with his 10 hands all at once and we, he could even shoot him from the tower if he wants but to. He said that his mom had lived a uh, pathetic, useless life, uh, just being beaten at the hands of this man. So he, I feel he killed his mom because it was a mercy killing. He, he was just like, your, your life is done. You haven't lived a life. You've just been a victim. So I'm going to end you and put you out of your misery. Yeah. 
I I actually think that he killed his mother and his wife just in case mm-hmm. he lived through this, that he wouldn't have to see how they reacted mm-hmm. to him afterwards. Does that make sense? Like he wouldn't have to see the shame in their eyes because he's a mass murderer or the disgust that his wife would have for him yeah. for committing these crimes. I actually think that's I, why I think he killed you're him. right, uh, especially his wife, because he has no motivation to murder her. There's nothing there. There's no reason why. So yeah, <laughs> it's it's just brutal. But this is the this is the case. This is the story. This is the shooting that I think started it all. And I don't really understand how this became a thing in America. Do you think it's a tumor? I don't or think not it's a tumor. tumor. I think it was him with the plan. I, I disregard the tumor. <laughs> it might have had a factor in it, but I disregard the tumor myself. Well, I like the fact that you said that the tumor might be a rumor. The tumor <laughs> might be a rumor. And I think possibly so. And that would be to cover up the discharge his involvement in the United States Marines. But whether it's a tumor or not, this was a horrible tragedy and something that, um, and the biggest mass shooting in history as of 1966. Justin, I want to thank you for joining us in the garage i've always been a fan of you and aaron big generation y fan if if somebody wants to check out your podcast well actually you have two podcasts we have the generation tell me about your two shows if you don't know about that show i don't i don't know what rock you've been living under you can find us anywhere itunes stitcher all that stuff uh when you talk about true crime you have to talk about mental illness. You have to talk about domestic abuse, but sometimes you can't really go really deep into it in lieu of the story. So I started another podcast called the peripheral where I interview listeners such as yourself that are listening right now about, uh, rape, about domestic abuse, about mental illness, about addiction. Uh, just any story that is, somebody that thinks they might be alone and hopefully others will hear it and you'll know that it's not something on the peripheral. It's something that should be in the mainstream. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully I can be a guest on your show. That would be awesome. (laughs) Soon. All right, man. Uh, I don't think I'm planning to see you until crime con next year, but until then we will, we'll drink some more. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Hopefully you guys enjoyed a little bit of the mashup this week. Check out our good buddies, Justin and Aaron, and their podcast, Generation Y. It can be found anywhere, iTunes, any podcast app, or you can check them out on the web, thegenerationypodcast.com. If you'd like to hear Nick and Aaron's mashup, that's going to be episode 291 on the Generation Y podcast feed. So check that out. Until next week, be good, be kind, and don't you litter. up.